One of the main themes of my thinking and writing uh, for my whole life has been the imagination of alternatives. And in particular, uh, al the alternative content of the progressive cause uh, and the alternative that can do justice to the elevation of human life to a higher level of scope, of intensity, of capability. The fundamental idea in politics is always the idea of greatness, our ascent, and how it is that we can so organize society that we all have a better chance to die only once. And when we raise the idea of greatness, the question is always, Greatness for whom? Greatness shared or not shared? And for the progressive, the central question, how can we become bigger together? Uh, now, uh, that question comes to life to the extent that it bears on the practical organization of society and of the economy. And Thus, the immense opportunity offered by the emergence now in the world of a new advanced practice of production. The most advanced practice of production today is what we call the knowledge economy or the learning economy or the experimental economy. Uh, it is the practice of production that is closest to the imagination. Uh, it has vast potential. This potential is suppressed and concealed because the knowledge economy, as it is manifest today, exists only as a series of fringes that exclude the vast majority of workers and of businesses. It is present in every part of the production system, uh, not simply in high-tech manufacture, with which it is often mistakenly identified. However, in every part of the production system, it appears only as an island. It is an insular vanguardism. And insofar as it remains under quarantine, its true potential and character remain uh, secret. A practice of production reveals its potential and its true nature only as it spreads across different parts of the production system. So the object of this book, The Knowledge Economy, is to explore the true character of this new advanced practice of production and the means by which it would cease to be uh, insular and deepen and spread and become a knowledge economy for the many. And by becoming a knowledge economy for the many, contribute to the advancement of the ideal of a shared bigness. So let's begin with the characterization of the knowledge economy, uh, <clears throat> how we are to understand it. Uh, at the most superficial level, at the level of what we call the technical division of labor or production engineering, uh, it has two sets of characteristics that are closely related. One is that it combines the destandardization of products and services uh, with production at large scale. So before the emergence of this practice of production, we had a contrast between mass production, which had scale but no destandardization, and craft production, which destandardized but had no scale. Now we have a set of technologies and practices 
that allow us to destandardize or customize and produce at scale at the same time. The second technical characteristic of this form of production is that it reconciles uh, a great decentralization of initiative with the preservation of coherence and momentum in the process of production. Think of it by, by analogy to the distinction between two kinds of military activity. On one side, there's the traditional infantry brigade organized in a command and control fashion. That's the military equivalent to industrial mass production. On the other hand, there's the guerrilla force or the special force that has the ability to disperse in the theater without losing its coherence and direction. That's the military equivalent to this advanced practice of production. Uh, but these are still only relatively superficial characteristics. And underneath them are a set of deeper attributes, which are not revealed by the knowledge economy in its present form because the knowledge economy remains so confined to these insular vanguards. The first deeper characteristic of the knowledge economy is that it has the promise to overcome what has been up to now the most constant and universal constraint in economic life, the so-called law of diminishing marginal returns. You commit an input to the process of production. The returns to an increase in the use of that input will uh, initially rise, then plateau, and then decline. That's the constraint of diminishing marginal returns. The deep basis of diminishing marginal returns is the episodic character of innovation. Innovation in the uh, inherited forms of advanced production has always been discontinuous. It comes from outside, from the evolution of science or technology. Then that inspires uh, a development in the process of production. The potential of that development initially produces a rise in output or in productivity, followed by a stabilization and then a decline. Insofar as the knowledge economy deepens and spreads, it shares in the character of the expansion of knowledge more than it shares in the character of the attrition of natural processes of transformation. Uh, innovation becomes increasingly internal to the process of production and it ceases to be episodic and instead becomes continuous or perpetual. And to the extent that innovation becomes perpetual, the promise of the knowledge economy, there is the potential to relax or even reverse the constraint of diminishing marginal returns. Second deeper characteristic of the knowledge economy has to do with the relation between production and imagination. The best firms become more like the best schools. And the organization of production begins to resemble the organization of scientific discovery. There is here the potential radically to change the relation between the worker and the machine. In the traditional advanced practices of production, industrial mass production or mechanized manufacturing, the worker worked as if he were one of his machines. In Adam Smith's pin factory or in Henry Ford's assembly line, by repetitious movements that mimic the operations of his rigid machine. But that's not the higher use of a machine. Everything that we have learned how to repeat, 
we can express in a formula or an algorithm, and we can then embody this formulaic activity in a physical contraption, the machine. The point of the machine is to do for us everything that we have learned how to repeat so that we can reserve our supreme resource, our time, for the not yet repeatable. The combination of the machine with the anti-machine, the human being, uh, then becomes much more powerful than either of them apart. The third characteristic of the knowledge economy at this deeper level is that to flourish, it demands a change in the moral culture of production. The established forms of the market economy uh, and of production were based on the generalization of a low level of trust among strangers. Uh, and thus we have command and control in the context of low trust. The knowledge economy prospers only in settings in which there is a heightening of the range of discretionary initiative allowed and demanded of each participant in the process of production and simultaneously an elevation of reciprocal trust, a heightening of the level of trust among the productive agents. Uh, that's the change in the moral culture of production. So all of these characteristics together compose this greater potential of the knowledge economy, a potential that remains truncated and only partly tapped because of the confined character of the knowledge economy today. Well, that's an element uh, yeah. that the mar marginal cost, the increase in marginal cost is, can be close to zero. And which is, which is especially pertinent to the, to the platform companies. Uh, but it's only an aspect of this more general phenomenon. And it's a mistake uh, to associate the knowledge economy simply with the platform companies. They're just one of the many domains in which the, marginal, the knowledge economy Absolutely. develops. And the more general point is that the character of the knowledge economy more resembles the growth of knowledge than it resembles the transformations of nature. Right. So in the light of this new advanced practice of production, we change our conception of what makes the most advanced practice of production most advanced. One criterion is that it is the practice of production closest to the imagination. Now, what is the imagination? You could say that the, the mind has two aspects. In one aspect, the mind is like a machine. It's modular and formulaic. But in another aspect, the mind is not like a machine, a traditional machine. It's not modular or formulaic. It has the power to combine everything with everything else, the power that in mathematics and logic we call recursive infinity. And it also has the power to transgress its own presuppositions and to set aside its own established methods and to see something, to discover something that it can only retrospectively make sense of. This second aspect of the mind is what we call the imagination. The imagination requires distancing from the phenomenon and then the subsumption of the phenomenon seen from a distance under a range of possible variations. To understand something is to understand what it can become at the next step in the realm of the adjacent possible. 
That's the imagination. Now, nothing in the physical constitution of the brain determines the relative power of these two sides of the mind. Yes. The mind is machine and the mind is anti-machine. Their relative power is shaped by the organization of politics, society, and of culture. And in that sense, the history of culture is internal to the history of the mind. So that's one, one criterion for thinking about uh, what makes a practice of production most advanced. The other criterion is this, that uh, it has to do with the relation between our experiments in the transformation of nature and our experiments in the transformation of our cooperative regimes, of how we work together. One way of thinking about technology is that technology is simply the materialization of this conduit between our experiments and the transformation or mobilization of nature, energy, natural energy, and our experiments in the transformation of how we cooperate. That's what technology is. And the closer these two sets of experiments are, the more they're brought together organically, internally, the more advanced a process of production is. So here we have, in potential, a revolutionary practice, the promise of which is uh, limited and undermined by the, the confinement of the knowledge economy to these exclusive fringes. So what do we want? We want a knowledge economy for the many. And the question that this book addresses is how we are to get it. If you were to characterize all of economic history uh, from the standpoint of these ideas that we're discussing, you could distinguish the economic evolution of mankind into three large stages. So in one stage, in the first stage, the primary constraint on economic growth is uh, the surplus over current consumption, what Karl Marx called primitive accumulation. And both Marx and Smith the two greatest thinkers in the history of economics, believed that that continued to be the salient constraint in their own time. But they were mistaken uh, because for the, almost the entire history of civilization, the major constraint on economic growth has not been the surplus over current consumption, but the level of innovation. Uh, technological innovation, organizational innovation, institutional innovation, and conceptual innovation. Under the reign of scarcity and under the aegis of the law of diminishing marginal returns. Now we are on the threshold of entering a third period in the economic evolution of mankind uh, in which uh, scarcity uh, continues, but this constraint of diminishing marginal returns can be lifted because the process of production begins to resemble the work of the imagination. Uh, so this is a, a formidable revolution, the significance of which remains hidden to us because we don't see the knowledge economy for what it can become, but only for what it now is in its confined form. Because it remains truncated. And now, uh, why does it remain truncated is then the question. It, it, we, it exists only in this isolated form. Its isolation has formidable consequences. 
The first consequence is economic stagnation, slowdown in the growth of productivity, and therefore in economic growth itself. In, in many countries in the world today, there is a discourse that goes under the label secular stagnation that attempts to naturalize this slowdown. But there's nothing natural about it. They say the contemporary technologies have much less potential than the technological innovations of 100 years ago. It's preposterous. What, in principle, could be more revolutionary in its significance than artificial intelligence? Uh, the, the, the problem is that this uh, potential is denied yes. to the vast majority of workers in forms. How then could there not be slowdown given this hierarchical segmentation of the production system? The, the, the economy is now divided in major countries of the world into a fringe of advanced production, then the declining mass production industries, and then a vast tail, a rear guard or a collection of rear guards. For example, traditional small business, which is largely fixated on the archaic a form of isolated family enterprise based on family saving and self-exploitation. Uh, and then we have this fundamental tragedy of the contemporary economies, uh, a vast intensity of effort and aspiration, uh, most of which goes to waste for, for lack of instruments and of opportunities. The second great character consequence of this isolated form of the knowledge economy is the aggravation of inequality. Anchored in the chasm that opens up between the advanced and the backward parts of production. And the traditional device for the moderation of inequality, which is compensatory and retrospective redistribution by progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements is inadequate to master the vast inequalities that arise from these hierarchical divisions within the production system. The only adequate response would be to overcome the divisions themselves. And the third consequence is a moral consequence, less tangible than the other two, but no less significant. The condemnation of the preponderant part of humanity to what is, in effect, make work. Uh, routine work, which uh, not only produces lower gains, but also yields less fun less room for creative engagement. Uh, 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 that's a, a, a universal belittlement. And the reduction of work to a purely instrumental activity from which people seek reprieve in domestic life and in the fantasies of popular culture. The advanced practice of production is, is not only high-tech manufacture. It's also intellectually dense services. Indeed, the sectoral distinction between services and manufacture is being undermined. Because in a sense, high-tech manufacture consists in crystallized intellectual services. And the vanguard is present even in agriculture in the form of precision or scientific agriculture mm -hmm. and in the effacement of the distinction between uh, natural and synthetic foods. Uh, so uh, it's all over, this vanguardism, but all over only as the fringe. Now, this is remarkable. The earlier most advanced practice of production was mass production, which began in the mechanized manufacturing that
that Adam Smith studied. <clears throat> Mass production was, by its very nature, associated with industry, with one sector of the economy. Nevertheless, it put its stamp on every part of the production system. Everything was changed on the model of industrial mass production, even agriculture. Now we have an advanced practice of production that should be susceptible to even more universal and rapid dissemination. But the opposite happens. Instead of spreading and deepening, it remains, it remains arrested within these insular vanguards. Uh, now, why has this happened? So at the most superficial level, you could say it happens uh, because uh, unlike mass production, the, the new vanguard does not consist of a package of machines and skills that are readily stereotyped, reduced to a set of formulas, and transportable easily as if they were a kind of kit from one country to another. Uh, mass production made uh, very modest demands on, uh, on the state or on education. It had minimalist requirements. So for example, the Traditional development economists always paid lip service to education. And they claimed that education was one of the fundamentals necessary to development. But the truth is that under industrial mass production, the worker barely needed to be educated. He needed only three things, elementary literacy and numeracy, a disposition to obey, and physical dexterity, especially hand-eye coordination. Now it's all different. He really does need to be educated to take advantage of the potential of numerically controlled machine tools. And we can discuss later what kind of education, but it is an education with a radically different content that is now required. Now, uh, this beginning of an explanation needs to be seen against the background of a more general problem, which is the following. Whenever there is a, an innovation in the world that is regarded as useful or indispensable for a country to flourish in the midst of worldwide ideological and economic and military competition, the tendency is for the innovation to be adopted in the form that least disturbs the ruling interest and the established preconceptions. That is what you could call the path of least resistance. The insular knowledge economy, the knowledge economy in its present confined form, is a characteristic example of the path of least resistance, it is the adoption of these innovations in the form that is least subversive of the ruling interests and the ruling ideas. That's how to understand it. We have transformative practice and uh, programmatic imagination in the world so that we can have an alternative to the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is always the most probable outcome, but it is never the necessary or only outcome. And that's then the beginning of a way of thinking about the genealogy of this exclusive form of the knowledge economy. Well, that's the whole nature of history in which uh, an innovation happens initially in an exclusive form and then uh, out of a series of 
ideological and practical pressures. There's then a series of conflicts to uh, advance it in a more radical form. So could you think of one example from history that you could point to that, that, that one might connect to? Well, every example. Let's take again a military analogy. So. Uh, uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, in the period of the Napoleonic Wars, is the development of artillery. And the potential of artillery uh, required uh, an operational development in the field. That is, to exploit it, or to take a later example, the tank at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, required forces that were capable of dispersing in the theater and having great operational flexibility. Uh, the armies of the aristocratic and autocratic states with which revolutionary and Napoleonic France was at war were unable to have this flexibility because they were armies of conscripted peasants who would run away unless there were people standing around them and behind them with bayonets who would force them to remain in formation. Revolutionary France had the advantage of having an army of citizens who were committed to the cause. And then they were able to take advantage of the potential of the technology. So, the, the technology is not self-determining. It, the, the achievement of its potential always depends on the social, cultural, and institutional context. And the, the winning force is the force that can tap the potential denied by the path of least resistance. That's what always happens. Uh, so now we have this problem of the insular knowledge economy, uh, in which we're barely scratching the surface of this potential. And in this truncated form, the knowledge economy appears accompanied by a series of dangerous perversions. Uh, for example, it is accompanied by the consignment of an increasing part of the labor force in the major countries of the world to circumstances of precarious employment. We think that the natural form of the organization of labor is the assembly of a stable labor force in large productive units such as factories under the aegis of big corporations. And that was the hegemonic form of the organization of production from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th. But before then, production was largely organized on the basis of decentralized contractual arrangements, like the putting out system described by Karl Marx in the early chapters of Das Kapital. Putting out the capitalist gives the machines to the worker who works with his family at home, like a sewing machine. He works with his family and friends at home. The capitalist provides the machine and the material. And the worker is an employee. He has a contractual arrangement. So in a sense, that's what's once again beginning to happen in the world, but now on a global scale. So we have the mega firms of the, of the insular knowledge economy controlling its commanding heights and discovering a way to transform part of the production process into routines or commodities. Those parts, these firms, subcontract to workers and businesses in remote parts of the world where the wages and the tax take are much lower. An increasing part of the labor force is consigned to precarious employment. A new putting out system on a global scale. Uh, that's an example of the, per, of the perversions that characteristically accompany 
this insular form of the knowledge economy. So how are we to overcome this? And there are three sets of requirements for the overcoming of this insularity of the new vanguardism. There are cognitive and educational requirements. There are social and moral requirements. And there are legal and institutional requirements. Uh, a word about each. So first, the cognitive and educational requirements. What kind of education does the knowledge economy demand? It requires a form of education that accords priority to the analytic and synthetic capabilities of the mind, rather than the mastery of information. Uh, but these capabilities are never acquired in a vacuum of content. They're acquired only in dealing with content. However, what matters with respect to content is not encyclopedic superficiality, but selective depth. The development of the, of the capacity to, to disassemble pieces of knowledge, uh, not areas of knowledge, into pieces and reassemble them, not just in mathematics, but in everything, in the study of history or of society, uh, in dealing with language and literature. The priority of these analytic and synthetic powers over information, and with respect to information, depth rather than coverage. The social setting must be cooperative, and rather than the combination of individualism and authoritarianism that characterizes the traditional classroom. Cooperation among students, among teachers, among schools, teamwork, such as the cooperative practice of advanced science. And above all, a fourth characteristic of this form of education, that it be dialectical. Every discipline, every method, should be studied from contrasting points of view. Nothing should be taught once. Everything should be taught at least twice. Uh, that's the only way to liberate the mind. So uh, the orthodoxies of the university culture are characterized by the forced marriage of method and subject matter. For example, economics is not the study of the economy. It's the study of a method pioneered by the marginalist theoreticians at the end of the 19th century. And any study of the economy by some other method is not recognized as economics. Uh, the life sciences are taught by a historical method in the light of uh, the influence of Darwinism. Uh, but fundamental physics is studied by an anti-historical method. So, but why? We discovered in the 1920s that the universe has a history. Cosmology is not an afterthought. It is about the fundamental, every part of nature is historical. Why should fundamental physics be taught by an anti-historical method? So this is what happens in the university. So there's this forced marriage of method and subject matter. The national curriculums in the world are, pre are kind of infantilization of these orthodoxies. And they induce the young to mistake the dominant ideas for the way things are. The result is that they are emasculated early and delivered to the universities prepared for a life of intellectual servility. What we then desire is a form of basic education that is deeper, more profound, more transformative than the form now provided by the universities, so that the young would come to the universities already immunized uh, against this intellectual servitude, 
Uh, now, that's a, a, a simple description of the kind of education that the knowledge economy requires. And it requires it not only at the beginning, but throughout a life. There may be a metric, but I don't have it, by which to measure the level of servility. It's not simply a, an intellectual problem, a problem of method. It's a problem of surrender, of lack of hope, in which the individual sees few opportunities for transformation. And in the elite universities, it's very common for people to begin with large hopes and then not to find a way to achieve them. So in the Emile Brousseau writes, they couldn't become men, so they decided to become rich. Uh, and this is a, a tragedy endlessly reenacted in our world yes. where uh, the would-be uh, challengers of the existing order are, uh, become worldly. And uh, we know that the worldly are unable to change the world. So that's what we end up with. We end up with the soldiers in the army of the path of least resistance. The crucial experience is the experience of transformation. So people think that hope is the cause of action, but this is a mistake. Hope is the consequence of action. Uh, so it's, it's necessary to be able to have a, an experience of agency. It can be small. So the, you know, uh, Goethe remarks that the, the position of contemplation, of o passive observation, always leads to irony and surrender. The observer is always a fatalist. What the discovery of transformative opportunity is always associated with action. It can be intellectual action as well as practical action. But this is what's fundamental. Uh, and to the, ex to the extent that a person is introduced to this experience of an enhanced agency, yes. the person then acquires hope. To be hopeful, it's not necessary to win it's only necessary to act. And so every form of production and of education that induces this experience of action is then able to sustain hope. And that changes everything. This is part of a much larger story which is a background, part of the background, or one of the many backgrounds to this whole conversation that we're having. Uh, for two or three hundred years, there has been a project in the world, a revolutionary project, uh, that has put the whole world on fire. It has, this project has a political side and a personalist mm -hmm. side. The political side was carried by the doctrines of democracy, of liberalism, of socialism, breaking the hierarchical structure of societies around the world. And the personalist side was carried by romanticism, and especially by the worldwide popular romantic culture, with its message that the ordinary man and woman is not so ordinary after all, and contains the divine spark that we become more human by becoming more godlike. Now, this has been, for at least 200 years, the commanding agenda in the world. It has enemies, but all the other agendas in the world react to it. Now it is in this paradoxical situation of being both strong and weak. It is strong, it remains strong, because it is still the commanding agenda against which all the others react. 
but it is weak because its votaries no longer know what its next step should be, either on the political side or on the personal side. Uh, so this is an explanation of my attitude. My life happens to have fallen in a counter-revolutionary interlude, what I hope will be a brief counter-revolutionary interlude in this long revolutionary period in the history of humanity. And I am determined not to allow my actions and ideas to be controlled by the biases of this counter-revolutionary interlude. I want the revolution to continue. But to continue, it has to be reinvented. That is, we need to know what its next steps are on both sides. And I then see the emergence of something like the knowledge economy as an opportunity for the continuation of this revolutionary project. This is just by way of explaining yeah. the larger world historical setting of our conversation. Well, uh, so it's this period, especially since the Second World War, it has it, a retreat from structural vision and the hope of structural change and structural alternatives. Calamities, the ideological calamities of the 20th century, their vast hopes and the failure of these hopes, and now this retreat into the management of the established order. Uh, the progressives appear on the stage of history, the would-be progressives now, as the humanizers of the inevitable. They have no project. Their project is to put a human face on the project of their conservative adversaries. They, they come armed with sugar to distribute the sugar to sugarcoat. Uh, and the, uh, the elites in these countries on uh, both sides of the Atlantic and the rich North Atlantic world uh, have as their hegemonic project now to combine European-style social protection with American-style economic flexibility within a barely adjusted version of the inherited institutional framework. Uh, and they, that's on the political and economic side. And then on the moral side, they believe that public life can deal only with cold marginal efficiencies and equities, and that the sublime must be privatized. So they are engaged in the privatization of the sublime, the religious, the artistic, the adventures of subjectivity embarking on its roller coaster of uh, adventurism completely dissociated from the remaking and reimagination of society. That's this world of theirs, which is a, a world bereft of hope, of, of structural vision. It is, this is the world of the counter-revolutionary interlude. Uh, and that's the world that we must turn against. Uh, and we can't turn against it using the instruments of the 19th century radicals we have to develop a new way of thinking and of acting. One way to uh, uh, explain is this. Uh, the, the experience now in the world of proposing alternatives, programmatic argument, the characteristic experience is the following. I propose something that's distant from what exists. Then you say, that's very interesting, but it's utopian. I propose something close to what exists. You say, that's feasible, but it's trivial. Everything that can be proposed now in the world, in the current climate of opinion, is likely to appear to be either trivial or utopian. This uh, false dilemma, uh, threatens to paralyze the programmatic imagination. It results from a misunderstanding of the nature of a programmatic argument or a transformative practice. It's not about blueprints. It's about sequences of steps. It's not architecture. It's music. And the two most important attributes 
of a programmatic argument are always that in marker direction, which can always be explored at points close or far away from what exists, and that it select in the immediate circumstance the initial steps by which to begin to move in that direction. Now, these problems are aggravated by a circumstance arising from the history of ideas, which is that we now have no credible and usable way of thinking about structural change and structural alternatives. The most important influence on the left was Marxism, Marxist theory, and classical European social theories like it. So Marxism had a structural idea, but it was a structural idea entangled in a series of fatalistic illusions that there is a closed menu of alternative regimes in history, like feudalism, capitalism, socialism. Each of them is an indivisible system which is either managed or replaced all at once, and that there are laws governing the succession of these systems in history. So we don't need to have a project because history has one for us. All false. And we continue to use the vocabulary of these intellectual traditions, but we no longer believe in their assumptions. One of the many noxious implications of these ideas is a binary view of politics. There are basically two kinds of politics. There's the reformist management of a system, or there is the revolutionary substitution of one system by another. Uh, if the revolutionary substitution is not in the cards, or would be too dangerous, even if it were feasible, what's left to do is to manage, to humanize. So this is what we have in the world. We have many countries governed by ex-Marxists, disenchanted Marxists, uh, in which the idea, the fantasy of the revolutionary substitution has been turned on its head and become an alibi for its opposite, which is this humanization project. Uh, it's not like that. Uh, the idea of total change is just a limiting case. Structural change, when it really happens in history, is almost invariably fragmentary, but can nevertheless become revolutionary in its outcome if it persists in a certain direction. So that then helps explain the tissue of confusions about change uh, and this false dilemma of the utopian and the trivial. Confusions, one confusion after another. The narrator in Proust says, we are friends with those whose ideas are at the same level of confusion as our own. That's the principle of affinity in political and cultural life. Uh, and thus the importance of intellectual clarification to redeem us little by little from these confusions that both unite and divide us. The situation is overdetermined because we have this experience mm -hmm. of relative stagnation in the rich North Atlantic world in the rest of the world, outside, in these large countries like China, India, Russia, Brazil, the potential for transformation is uh, suppressed by a combination of political despotism or democratic fragility with mental colonialism. So the, wor the, world, the world is restless under the yoke of the dictatorship of no alternatives and looking for alternatives, but in a circumstance in which the, the, there's a, a kind of Brownian motion from below of micro-experimentalism, but it's no longer harnessed
to the idea of large-scale alternatives. Right. And so that's, and, and in the high culture uh, of the rich countries, in the academy, uh, we have the denial of transformative vision. So in the hard positive social sciences, we have a series of projects of rationalization of the existing arrangements. Each discipline does it in a different way. Uh, economics is the most important, and it does it in a unique way of its own. They're all instances of what in the history of philosophy we would call right-wing Hegelianism. The real is rational. Uh, and, but each social science does it in a different way. Economics has done it by radically dissociating uh, theory from empiricism and by developing a theory of economic life that is a theory of exchange and not a theory of production uh, and by having a view of the economic institutions which is either completely empty of institutional content when economics is rigorous or uh, a fallacious identification of the abstract idea of the market with a particular contingent set of economic institutions. So the discipline is either rigorous and empty or it is potent and fallacious, as in market fundamentalism. Each discipline does it in a different way. That's the hard positive social sciences. Then we have in the normative disciplines of political philosophy uh, and legal theory, the, the genesis of a series of pseudo-philosophical props to these humanizing practices like compensatory redistribution. So, for example, the theories of justice in the Anglo-American Academy are a pseudo-philosophical gloss on the homely practices of social democratic redistribution in the second half of the 20th century. So the philosophers all agree about the bottom line, which is this institutionally conservative social democracy. They only agree, disagree about the top line, which is in what philosophical vocabulary should they adorn this conclusion on which they've all already agreed. So this is a, uh, this is a travesty of philosophy. It's like a kind of window dressing uh, and not what we think thought should be, which is a storm that takes us in a direction in which we didn't intend to go. And then in the humanities, we have consciousness embarking on this roller coaster of subjectivist adventurism, uh, dissociated from the reimagination or remaking of society. So we have rationalization, humanization, and escapism. And the adepts of these three tendencies pretend to be enemies, but we know that they're allies in the project of disarming the transformative will and the transformative imagination. That's the high academic culture, which uh, rather than being part of any solution is obviously part of the problem. So I'm giving you this as an example of the overdetermination of the circumstance. So the, the, the circumstance of stagnation arises from the combination of all of these influences that then reinforce each one another and induce a false sense of the naturalness of this gingerbread construction that we have created for ourselves, chaining ourselves under, un, uh, and deluding ourselves into believing that these chains are the expression of necessity and of reason. Like the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we uh, must recognize the primacy of structural change over humanization. Meaning, among other things, the institutional arrangements, change in the institutional arrangements that shape the primary distribution of advantage. Yes. And not simply the after the fact correction through progressive taxation and social entitlements of this original distribution. 
So what are, what are examples of the arrangements that influence the primary distribution? First of all, the arrangements that determine the relation between the advance and backward parts of production, what we're talking about. Right. Second, the arrangements that shape the relation of labor to capital. Uh, if there has to be flexibility in the realities of the new economy, why should flexibility become radical economic insecurity? We need a new body of laws that masters this new reality and prevents flexibility from turning into radical insecurity and from the depression of the returns to labor. A third example is the relation of finance to the real economy. Well, the first is what we're talking about. It's, right. So it's, uh, we're gonna, it's talking it's about that. the conditions under which the knowledge economy becomes inclusive. The second, which is the relation of labor to capital, begins in initiatives that promote the organization, the representation, and the protection of precarious labor. So Uber drivers. So that, so self-employment as a disguised form of wage labor, as in the example of Uber drivers. And a, a very simple principles of legal protection, for example, that labor provided under conditions of temporary employment or contractual employment uh, uh, of contract without stable employment should be remunerated at a level at least equivalent to the analogous form of labor performed under the conditions of stable employment. In other words, the principle of price neutrality in the returns to labor. Uh, and finance and, and the real economy. So we have now a dissociation of finance from production. The transactions of the real economy become a pretext for successive layers of financial engineering that then make no plausible contribution to the increase of output or the ascent of productivity. So I was saying that the liberals and the socialists of the 19th century recognized the primacy of structural change, as we should. Well, they, they, all, had, they all had their formula. The, the, the liberals had the formula of the system of private rights, classical private law. The socialists had an idea of the reorganization of the economy under the control of the state. Each of them came with their formula. So like them, we recognize the primacy of institutional change. Unlike them, we can no longer confide our, our future and trust ourselves to some dogmatic institutional blueprint. So we have a problem without historical precedent, which is the need to develop structural alternatives and nourish a structural imagination without succumbing to a structural dogmatism. Therefore, one of the most important attributes of the alternative economic and political arrangements that we require is that they be corrigible in the light of experience. They can't be neutral because every institutional order tilts the scales in favor of some forms of experience and against others. But what they can be is open to a large range of contradiction and be corrigible in the light of experience. In other words, they can organize their own revision. That's what we want. So it's the organization of experimentalism rather than the entrenchment of an institutional dogma. When we began this long digression, we were speaking about just the educational requirements of an inclusive knowledge economy. And the second set of requirements are the the social and moral requirements. I, I said before, yeah. the knowledge economy depends on a change in the moral culture of production, right. accumulation of social capital, 
elevation of the level of discretionary initiative and of reciprocal trust among participants in the process of production. Uh, societies differ in the disposition and the ability to cooperate. Is this just a natural fact about society, or can it become the object of deliberate action? So we can change it, uh, not by a single initiative, a silver bullet, but by the cumulative effect of many initiatives. So for example, with cooperation, that education be cooperative, that in the provision of public services, the state partner with independent civil society, acting through cooperatives not for profit, together with the state in the experimental and competitive provision of public services, or in the establishment of a principle of voluntary or mandatory social service. Everyone should have two positions in society, a position in the production system and a position in helping to take care of other people beyond the boundaries of family selfishness. In other words, we can elevate the level of collective action by multiplying the ways in which people can work together to solve problems, doing many things together. And this touches on a fundamental problem in the contemporary societies, which is the nature of nationalism. So now the European societies have come out of a situation in which the only social cement was money transfers organized by the state, these redistributive entitlements and social programs, against the background of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. Uh, now there are increasing migratory flows in Europe, degrading the level of cultural and ethnic homogeneity and exposing the inadequacy of money as a social cement. Money is not an adequate basis of social cohesion. The only adequate basis of social cohesion is direct engagement with other people, doing things with them. Now, I was saying then that the, the national division in the world, you can see as a, on a spectrum. So in one pole of the spectrum, a nation is like a tribe. It's based on a quasi-biological principle of similarity, based on common descent, or even in the absence of common descent, on homogeneity, on sameness. But at the other pole of the spectrum, the nation doesn't depend on sameness or common descent. It's the development of a common project, a way of, uh, a way of being human, a series of forms of collective action. Along the way on the spectrum, there is an accident, a problem that emerges, which is the following. In this period of world history, the nations in the world that compete against one another, ideologically, economically, militarily, discover that they have to empty their collective identities. They have to roam the world to find things that work. They have to give up parts of themselves. They have to adopt arrangements that come from somewhere else. There's an evisceration of the tangible collective identity, the customary content, the traditional culture. Uh, so the actual differences among the nations of the world wane, but the desire to be different is aroused as the actual difference wanes. And two nations, that live side by side, come to hate each other, 
not because they are different, but because they are becoming alike and want to be different. This is the poisonous character of the contemporary nationalism. Uh, actual difference is porous and susceptible to compromise. The will to difference is incapable of compromise because it has no content. It, and it becomes the object of an intransigent faith. Faced with this phenomenon, then, there are two possible responses. The response of liberal cosmopolitanism is to suppress the will to difference. The response of radical democracy is to equip the will to difference, to create forms of economic and political life that allow the nations of the world to create new difference. Prophecy is more important than memory. And the differences that matter most are the differences that we will create, not the differences that we have inherited. That's part of this background. And this, these alternatives, these democratizing and experimentalist alternatives, must flourish in a world in which the ability to create difference increases rather than diminishes. The desire to, to be different is dangerous in proportion as it is empty because the, the, the abstract will to difference is the danger, whereas actual difference is fertile and the ability to create actual difference. And that's what we want. So there has two, it has many parts. One part is economic, an experimentalist economy that increases our, and that in which the market economy is not fastened to a single version of itself. There are alternative regimes for the decentralization of access to productive resources, not just the traditional regimes of contract and, pro and property. Uh, a high energy democracy that elevates the temperature of politics, hastens the pace, allows a country to proceed down a certain path, but uh, authorize parts of itself to diverge from the predominant solutions and to create counter models of the national future, to hedge its bets about the future. And this form of education that is dialectical, that teaches everything from contrasting points of view. So what are we doing then? We are expanding radically the ability of humanity to create difference. Difference is not the problem. Difference is the task and the solution. And it is the waning of difference that is the problem. And so we don't want a, a world that is made uniform and compelled to converge uh, in one particular direction. Humanity can develop its powers and possibilities only by developing them in different directions. That's what we want. And that is one of the conditions for our ascent to this higher form of life. So these are all the social and moral condition, requirements. And now there are legal and institutional requirements. The market economy has no single natural and necessary form. There is not one form of the market economy. We have to imagine a trajectory in which we begin to open up the form that the market economy can take in the interest of deepening and disseminating this new advanced practice of production. It can begin small. So at the first stage, we can think what we want is to mobilize the powers of the state not to subsidize or prefer a particular sector or a particular line of production, but to expand access to advanced practice, advanced technology, advanced knowledge, and credit. So, for example, in the first half of the 19th century, uh, family-scale entrepreneurial agriculture 
in countries like the United States was organized through the creation of a new kind of agricultural market. The, the public lands were distributed on the agricultural frontier. Uh, the state uh, organized a new set of, uh, of teaching institutions, the land-grant colleges, and then brought the advanced practice to the local producer through the system of agricultural extension. So that family-scale agriculture wouldn't be subsistence agriculture. It would be entrepreneurial agriculture at a small scale. It was a project of uplift. So it was, in effect, and, and more than that, a whole set of devices such as crop insurance and agricultural income insurance that safeguarded family-scale agriculture against the unique combination of climate risk and economic risk. Strategic coordination, decentralized strategic coordination between the government and the small-scale producer, and among the small-scale producers, cooperative competition. They con competed against one another, but they also pooled resources achieving economies of scale. Now we would need to, the same kind of thing with respect to this deepening and spread of the knowledge economy. An equivalent to the 19th century agricultural extension, reaching increasing parts of this vast periphery, this rear guard of the production system. So say all of that is like the first stage. Then in the second stage, we begin to develop the institutional architecture of a new form of the market economy. On the vertical axis of the relation between governments and firms, especially small and medium-sized firms, a form of strategic coordination between government and business that is decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimental. And on the horizontal axis of the relations among firms, cooperative competition. They compete and cooperate at the same time. And then the third stage, more radical, far further into the future, multiplying the terms on which people can have access, decentralized access, to productive resources and opportunities. Alternative regimes of contract and property coexisting experimentally in the same market order. So at one pole of the spectrum, the traditional regime of unified pri private property, which has an advantage in some domains of economic activity. The advantage is that it allows an entrepreneur to do at his own risk something in which no one else believes. But then in other parts of the economic order, the creation of temporary and conditional claims on productive resources. The state manages the productive resource, part of the productive resources of society, not by a system of discretionary allocation, but by a kind of capital auction in which anyone who can assure society of the highest rate of return for the use of those productive resources gets to use them so long as he can assure that rate of return. And the underlying rate of interest charged for the use of productive resources becomes the basic form of public finance rather than taxation. Now, this is far into the future. The point is, the point is it's an auction. You say the, the capital resources, there's an auction. There are a set of trusts established by the state, so like independently managed. The computing power will no, whoever, whoever can assure society of the highest rate of return for, for the use of part of the productive apparatus of society ha can use them. So then at this third more radical stage, uh, experiments in the different regimes for the decentralized allocation of access 
to the capital resources of society. The traditional property rights should be only one of them, shouldn't be the only one. Uh, now, these three sets of requirements that we've discussed, the educational and cognitive requirements, the social and moral requirements, and the legal and institutional requirements, do not form a system. The process is a process of combined and uneven development. You, you advance on one front as far as you can, then you hit against the limit, and you can't go further until you've advanced on another front. Wh which front you advance on first or in what order is shaped by circumstance. Uh, but it's not a, a take it or leave it a system in which you either do everything at the same time or you do nothing. That's not the nature of structural change. It is, by its very nature, fragmentary and can nevertheless be cumulative. Now, we can ask then, what are the basic conditions that make it more or less likely that a society will be able to satisfy these three sets of requirements for the deepening and dissemination of the knowledge economy. And those conditions are basically of two kinds, uh, cultural and political. The fundamental cultural condition is the dissemination of an experimentalist impulse in every department of our experience. Uh, and that, too, can be shaped by practical initiatives. Uh, for example, the dialectical character of education, or the provision by the state of an opportunity for people to change careers and reinvent themselves in the middle of their adult lives. Uh, with a profound impact on the character of human experience. The ordinary experience of life is someone comes to the middle of his life and after having dreamed of many possible selves, comes to think, this is the only life that I'm ever going to live. With a depressive effect on this capacity for self-reinvention, which is what we want. The other fundamental condition for the satisfaction of those requirements is political. The creation of a high energy democracy. A high energy democracy is a democracy that allows society to master its own structure, that diminishes the dependence of change on crisis, and that therefore overthrows the rule of the living by the dead. A high energy democracy requires three sets of innovations. It requires innovations first that elevate the temperature of politics. That is to say the level of organized popular engagement in political life. We shouldn't have to choose between a politics that is cold and institutional and a politics that is hot and extra or anti-institutional. We shouldn't have to choose between Madison and Mussolini. We should be able to have a politics that is hot and institutional at the same time. And that depends on the relation between money and politics, on the access to the means of mass communication, and on the electoral regimes. The second set of innovations has to do with the pace of politics, rapid resolution of impasse through early elections or comprehensive programmatic plebiscites. And the third set of innovations required by a high energy democracy has to do with the relation between strong central initiative by the government and divergence from the predominant path. As society goes down a certain path, 
it should allow part of the country to diverge from the predominant solutions and create counter models of the national future. Not just in federations like the United States, but also in unitary states like the United Kingdom or France. There can be a combination of strong central initiative with radical devolution in which you allow part of the country to secede from the general solution so long as the secession is not used to entrench the prerogatives, the privileges of part of the population. So subject to both judicial and political check. The objective is to elevate the, the energy level of, of democracy. And uh, the experimentalist culture and the high energy democracy are the fundamental background conditions under which a society can then satisfy those three sets of requirements for the deepening and dissemination of the knowledge economy. Now, then I would say the a unifying theme in all of these changes is the enhancement of agency, of the capacity of the individual to act within the context, beyond the context, and against the context. The, the fundamental functional imperatives of the advanced societies are the enhancement of agency and the development of higher forms of cooperation. And they are both indispensable, but are in some tension with each other. Because uh, every advance, every experiment threatens the existing cooperative regime. The highest form of cooperation is the one that is least threatened by perpetual innovation, and that's what we want. Uh, uh, now, in this, in this project, the deeper characteristics of the knowledge economy are more important than the superficial characteristics. The requirements, those three sets of requirements, are more important than the deeper characteristics. And the conditions for the satisfaction of the requirements, the experimentalist culture and the high energy democracy, are more important than the fulfillment of the requirements. So, so in other words, it's not just the knowledge economy itself. It's what its deepening and dissemination demand that has this transformative fertility. It's as if we were to say that, that uh, rather than transforming ourselves in order to become richer, to develop our practical capabilities, we will use the development of our practical capabilities as a pretext in order to become bigger. Uh, and that's a, a way of understanding the significance of this project. The project is uh, giving more space in the world to the disruptors and to the experience of disruption. It is, a, in a sense, normalizing disruption. The well, contemporary societies differ radically in the level of collective organization. So which one so, do you look to if you were to No, you them? don't look to anyone to imitate because the existing forms of collective organization oh. are all tainted in one way or another. But so let's take an example remote from this discussion of production. Uh, problem of violence, of criminality. Uh, there are two different phenomena, organized crime and episodic crime. Organized crime is largely an expression of the weakness of the state. It's a kind of parallel state that flourishes to the extent that the state is absent or weak. Uh, episodic crime is largely an expression of the disorganization of society. Uh, it flourishes when society is not organized, and because not organized, not watching, 
people don't feel responsible for one another. They're not monitoring what's happening next door. That's when episodic crime flourishes. So it's, they, people often think this episodic crime is the expression of poverty and inequality. But take a society, take, compare two countries, Brazil and India. In, in, in India, which is poorer than Brazil per capita, the level, much poorer, the level of organized crime, of episodic crime at the grassroots level is much lower than in Brazil. Why? Because in India, there is a much higher level of collective organization in the, at the village level, at the grassroots. Now, it's a form of collective organization tainted by its association with, with caste, with hierarchy, with uh, uh, religious divisions. But, but, but it works. And the point is that, that organization is power. Uh, uh, the, the, a form of organization which is not inherited, which is not based on descriptive differences, inherited differences, but which is the result of doing things together for the, for the creation of new difference. So this whole conversation is an illustration of the point with which we began the conversation. Uh, what matters is the, the reshaping of the structure, as opposed to simply the humanization of the structure. And the reshaping of the structure in the service of this enhancement of our ability to act, the enhancement of agency. So what is it that should distinguish now a progressive from a conservative? So first, the progressive believes in our ascent to a higher form of existence and wants a shared bigness, that we should become bigger together. Uh, so the objective of the progressive is not the humanization of society. It is the divinization of humanity. And the uh, overcoming of entrenched inequality is entirely subsidiary to this larger goal. And second, what distinguishes the progressive from the conservative is that the progressive refuses to take the established institutional order of the economy, politics, and civil society as the insurpassable horizon of his action and proposes to change that structure and indeed proposes to change the relation of humanity to these structures. So this is a very important point. So there are two, there are two mistakes we can make about structure. One is the mistake of the dogmatist, of the conservative, of the idolater of the institutions, who says, this is the definitive form of a free society, of a free economy, of a democratic politics. Entrenching that structure against challenge and change and claiming that it represents a neutral order. The invocation of neutrality is always in the service of the entrenchment of some sectarian structure. The other mistake is the, is the romantic illusion, which is that uh, spirit is the hand, structure is the hand of Midas, killing the spirit. So the spirit only exists in those interludes in which we shake the structure, the mob in the streets, as opposed to the bureaucratic apparatus, the experience of romantic love, as opposed to the routines of married life, and so forth. Uh, so the romanticism in this respect is a form of despair. 
it, what it despairs of is the possibility of changing the relation of spirit to structure. That we, so what are the structures? The structures are the frozen part of our activity. There's a, a struggle over the terms of our access to one another. This struggle is temporarily interrupted or contained. It's like a game of musical chairs. The music stops, and then we sit down on the chairs. The chairs are the structures. Uh, and then the question is, the more that those structures entrench themselves against challenge and change, the more they present themselves to us as an alien fate, and then we take them as part of the furniture of the universe, as if they were natural phenomena, and not just our own creations, and the frozen part of our, the kind of frozen fighting. And uh, we have two sets of moves. We have the ordinary moves that we make within a framework of assumptions and arrangements that we take for granted. And then we have the extraordinary moves by which from time to time we challenge and change pieces of this framework, typically under the provocation of crisis. Now, the more that these two categories of moves come to approach each other, so that the challenge and change of the framework results continuously from the ordinary business of life, the freer and greater we are. Because then we're masters of our own framework. And then we can engage in a structure without surrendering to it. We can be insiders and outsiders at the same time. And that's what we want. That is freedom. Uh, and that is power. And all of this conversation that we're having about the transformation of economic and political life is simply an instance uh, of that project, which is this project that I'm calling the divinization of humanity. Not divinization as Prometheanism, not divinization as the pretense to omnipotence and omniscience, but divinization as mastery of the divine attribute of transcendence. There is more in us than there is in the social and cultural worlds that we build and inhabit. We exceed them. They are finite in relation to us. We are infinite in relation to them. And we then want to create structures that are more hospitable to this condition of transcendent spirit although always flawed, defective, uh, uh, impermanent. Uh, and then, to the extent that we become these context-transcending agents, we are more capable of recognizing one another as the context-transcending originals that we all want to be. So the present uh, pattern of the ideological controversy in the world is the left consists supposedly of those who prioritize equality within the existing structure. So let's call that shallow equality. And the right consists of those who prioritize freedom within the existing structure. Call that shallow freedom. Uh, and then we, this is the traditional form of the ideological debate. It's the state versus the market. More market, less state. Uh, more state, less market. Synthesis of market and state. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that they're all conservatives. Uh, and that, and that uh, the, 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 what is the alternative? The alternative is deep freedom. Uh, deep freedom in, in which uh, mastery of the context, creation of the context of a structure that is an anti-structure because it facilitates its own revision. Uh, and uh, this elevation to a higher power, this effacement 
of the, of the, of, of the distance between our context preserving and our context transforming moves. And, 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 and therefore, the, 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 the strengthening of our participation in the divine attribute of transcendence. Well, there are different kinds of conservatives. So there's one kind of conservative, for example, who's a market fundamentalist and believes that a decentralized economy has a natural form. Uh, Robinson Crusoe is, is trading on his island. Give him enough time to trade, and he will eventually reproduce 19th century German private law. Uh, so that's one kind of conservative. Then another kind of conservative thinks that there are these traditions, uh, these, these national customs, uh, and there are these fossils that have to be preserved because that's all we have. And he doesn't realize that the fossils are being emptied out and that the difference that he is celebrating is waning and is being replaced by this abstract will to difference. So it's a series of confusions. It's, it's not just a contest of normative commitments. It is a, it is a, t a tournament of illusions. And we need insight. We need to liberate ourselves from these illusions in order to be freer and bigger. And this is an activity of enlightenment. Uh, emancipation is impossible without enlightenment. Uh, and thus, this campaign to achieve structural change must be associated with an attack on the tendencies that now prevail in the high culture the rationalizing, humanizing, and escapist tendencies so that we can have the ideas that we need to imagine these alternatives. There is no privileged formula of transformative action. You can begin little, you can begin from the bottom, you can begin from the top with, with comprehensive ideas, with fragmentary ideas, it doesn't matter where you begin or how you begin. It just matters in what direction you go. So you begin according to your circumstance, your national circumstance, your personal circumstance. Give up the desire to look for a formula, but look day and night for a direction. And then the experience of transformation uh, will give you the, the precious resource of hope, and hope will be insight.